Three, two, one, we are live. This is 2OF Entertainment. I always think after that music that you should be sitting there like in a smoking jacket with a pipe. Yeah, you know, that, nice. and, uh, that was my early years. I got rid of the early, pipe. Yeah, but we, and we should come around. It should be a dark lit room and you're in this red leather chair and we come around yeah. and you're like, yeah. I'm Paul like, Constable. And now we're going to talk about Canadian art. That's yeah. just, I don't know. That's what that music does. I'll have to have a deep English accent with that. That's yeah, right. Like Masterpiece Theater all of a sudden. I like that. Yeah. That'll be yeah. intimidating as all h yes <laughs> oh man we, you know i i go through we we talk about this before we go through all these different artists and we think my gosh yep. how could they only get anything different and they say well we have some different but some quite similar and we have uh an, a fairly prolific artist uh today um shelly ewing and mm -hmm. she's like so many artists are going through the same thing she's going through right now and that's a transitioning you transition right. from your 20 or 30 year job that you had into an art career, right? It's mm. happening all the time. Right. And uh, she was a prolific illustrator, a scientific illustrator, actually. And she wow. did work, um, you know, watercolors and acrylics, but then moved into digital doing two and three dimensional uh, uh, animations and, and renderings, I guess. Wow. And she's moved to that whole. So she went through the, the transition changes of uh, the digital age. Right. Um, but now she's going back to the tactile age, getting rid of that digital stuff and now moving into a whole, that other part of her life that she probably always wanted to do, but couldn't do it because she had the nine to five job she had to do these other things for that paid her way, like everybody else, you know, whether you work in a Starbucks or something, you yeah. got to do something sometimes to, uh, you know, augment your living. Yeah. But just talk about this transition period and how she's transitioned a bit from, uh, that daily work, even as an artist, a, a right. psychographic designer, I guess is what she was in the day. And she worked, uh, we'll talk to her about it though. That's, That's very cool. I like yeah. that. I, digital, too bad David's not here to talk about digital, right? She and David would talk about movies for six hours, digital yeah. movies and digital art. So it's a good thing that yeah. David's still on holiday for the next, I don't know, 20 years. He's so always on holiday. He, you know, he's, he, it's he, good took to be a, David. he took a COVID holiday. What are you talking he took about? A he took a COVID and then he took it. Now he's on his real holiday. And then I think when the time changes, he comes back, but he's only back for that five months. And then he, you know, does whatever he does. We're not really sure what he does. He's just well, it'd be, nice to see, yeah, it'd be nice to see him again. In there you time go. Please, come November, maybe. Yeah, there you go. Well, so should we bring your guest in? Yeah, let's bring Shelly and we'll just talk. Shelly, welcome to the show. Yeah, good morning. Good morning. Good Good morning, good day. Depends where you are. There you go. And I'm going to let you and Paul have at it. Enjoy. I will be back at the end and ask my three favorite questions. If okay. you've seen the show before, you know what they are. If not, eh, you're in trouble. Anyway. Yeah, I don't know what they are. I might not okay. have an answer. <laughs> great, a good fan of the show. Anyway, enjoy your interview. We'll talk with you soon. Cheers. Okay, thanks. You're well, welcome. Yeah. Well, good day to you. Good day. Yeah. It's a nice sunny day. Sun we have sunshine here, so yeah. I'm quite happy. Yeah, it's kind of nice to see, and obviously a little bit of a warm weather for the the fall as well. So it's yeah. kind of enjoyable, very much so. But we're, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about some of the things, but I think just bringing people up to speed. And I, I mentioned to Stephen, we we're talking about so many of us are transitioning in our in our in our art lives. We've come from one segment that was art related. In your case, you were uh, as a scientific illustrator. Is that is that yeah. true? Yeah. Yeah, it was illustration and graphic design, web design. It was like I was a jack of all trades, really. Isn't that the way it is? Yeah. 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 Once, so once you find you, technology you... and yeah. had to be learned, and I tore my hair out a few times at work <laughs> trying to go through that transition. But yeah. you know, we got there. I had good support, so. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of. Uh... I was, I was in the graphic industry as well, and it went through a horrific change. Um, so many jobs were 
shuffled over to other jobs and people had to either relearn yeah. or move on or do different things, take early retirements because some of them, they just couldn't handle uh, the commu computer needs. But I found in the production area that you as a graphic designer were now required to do everything, your pre-production, yeah. post-production, everything, like down to the finished art sent to the printer and even down yeah. to social media postings. So you're not just doing the graphic design anymore. You're now handling a lot more jobs, producing a lot more work in the same time frame. So yeah. the, burn, the burnout was there for a lot of people and it was just, there was just too much to be done. And well, it, I think, yeah. I think one of the things that I, when it went to computers, I think if you want to, you know, stay in ahead of the game in graphic design, once computers came on, you always have to, uh, learn new technology and new software uh, because we had uh, probably 60 to 80 scientific staff from PhDs to engineers to technicians that I worked for and you know just brilliant science cutting edge science and they obviously can do some of their own graphics you know they brought graphics to their desktop so mm -hmm. I found at work um, unless I always you know stepped it up one like you know they were doing photoshop and stuff well then i was going to do 3d so i think you have to treat i worked for the government but i treat my office like a business so i had to constantly make sure that i knew what was up and coming what was you know how we could do things in a more interesting way so i was constantly challenged with learning new software and some of the 3d stuff is very technically you know Don't technically me. involved yeah. so so, I mean, just like any software, I learned what I needed to, to do what I, you know, to meet the, the requirement. And, and there was probably a lot more I could have learned, but you do, you only have so many time because you're exactly right. You're, you're, you know, drawing a little graph or you're drawing a full fledged 3d illustration, you're printing posters, you're printing for symposiums, for museums, um, you know, you're print, you're producing illustrations for scientific magazines i'd go all over the world and you're just trying to support the scientists in any way you can so yeah. you're you're really spread all over the place with a lot of technology yeah um, so can you can you give us a little bit of your i guess your journey a little bit where you kind of started you um where, where were you from originally well i was from north battleford which is close to saskatoon in saskatchewan um, I, yeah yeah i stayed there until i was about 17 18 i came to medicine hat to take visual communications right. um at the time i think that was the very first year that the program turned in it was the second year of the program and i think it was an option to go to calgary and create your degree so i i did the the medicine hat college diploma program and an opportunity came up in medicine hat because um, of the research station here my instructor wife did that job and she was leaving because the 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 base of where this research center is is 50 kilometers away from medicine hat and she had small children so she found it very hard to not be home after school and stuff so he asked me if i'd be interested in this job and I had actually moved to Calgary for a little bit and I was working for kind of like an ad agency that did things, but I was just a gopher type girl and I was yeah. out of my element. I come from a small town and Calgary was booming in the eighties and I really didn't like the big city thing. I mean, I might've got used to it, but um, when this opportunity came, I called, he gave me a number and I cold called the guy, the scientist that was in charge of, of hiring, you know, the graphic design people. And I just explained to him I was interested and he asked me for an interview and they pretty much hired, I brought my portfolio and they hired me on the spot. Mm -hmm. So within two weeks I was working there and it was only a term <laughs> position. So I took a chance, I gambled and I could have been laid off in three months. I had a three month term and how it worked is with the government, um, the scientists who wanted me to be there the service to be there would fund my days at work so for five years i worked on this term thing so every six months i was you know facing layoff and after five years they have to make that job into a permanent position so i had to apply for my position and i ended up out there for 33 years oh wow 
Mm -hmm. Um, so I was very lucky and fortunate. I feel very thankful for that job at first. I probably didn't, I wasn't thinking like that. It wasn't really what I had planned for myself, but you know, who gets to do what they plan for themselves all the time. And I started to embrace the science. I found the science fascinating and just trying to, um, sometimes it was very difficult because I don't come from a scientific background. I did learn a lot about science over the years, obviously after 33 years talking with PhDs and having them explain their vision and their, you know, where they want to go with a project and what they're looking for and what they want to achieve. I, I started to understand, you know, concepts better, but you're basically drawing something that doesn't exist. Like you might be drawing something over a rocket trial that's going to be over five kilometers and you have to kind of put yourself up in the air and look down at the earth and, right. you know, where they launch it, where they're, what they're trying to um, do in your, your making an illustration of that. Yeah. And, you know, then the other extreme would be maybe they did a lot of vir- virus research, bacteria research. So things that go on in the body, medical type drawings. So you would, have to you know picture how how this virus interacts in your body and how you know creates havoc in your body and what kind of drugs would maybe come in and and you know put you well, back we'll, together yeah. so, well we'll get we'll get to i think we've got a really good background on what I, how does that affecting some i'm going to get steven to start our first image but how is that affecting some of the work that you're doing? Does, or do you feel that some of that influenced what you're doing now as working with back into the traditional mediums? Um, I think it influenced me in the way that when you're doing science and you're illustrating science, you have to convey to the audience what the scientist is trying to get through, but you're also conveying it in a, you have to make, you know, depending on the audience that's at hand, you have to make them understand it. So, but the other thing is, is when you're doing science, you have to be quite exact. Like you can't, you know, do an impressionist type of style when you're representing science because, um, you're, you know, we're looking for accuracy and, and things like that. So, yeah, I think it's really influenced me. I, I actually don't like that about my style. I'm trying to loosen up. <laughs> to but it's up. very hard. Like I have tried. I've I've tried to um, do, you know, abstracts and things like that. And, you know, people, I hear a lot of people comment on abstract art all the time and saying, well, what, you know, what is that? And how does, how is that art? But for me, it's the hardest thing. Like I remember doing an abs, trying to create an abstract something and, and, you know, it kept me up at night because I was just like arguing with the negative imposter space, the flow, you know, really over questioning it. And that's probably part of my problem. The science background has made me always, you know, is this is this represented right? Is this is this really is this a viewer going to get understand the science? So like this picture you're showing right now is very detailed. And yeah. when I started out, I didn't plan on doing that. Actually, I wanted to do the opposite. But. I find what happens to me is I get lost in the detail. Like I almost get um, like transposed and I'm in that space and I'm just there with the paint and the detail. And I'm I'm not really even thinking anymore what I'm doing. It just comes natural to me. Yeah. There is sometimes an automatic thing that an artist kicks in and you do what you do. But they're beautiful. They're beautiful pieces. And I don't, I don't think you, to diminish the fact that you you can create detail uh, in in a yeah. because this is somewhat abstract. I mean, you've got a great design background. I think yeah. design is a big piece of yeah. of, of what an artist does. It, it, yeah. it creates the impact. Um, if this was just a big splotch of red with a, a few little green lines and a, and a little piece of black, it would have a different feeling than what you've got here. So this yeah. one's got a journey all in itself. This this piece of work, you know, this flower, you're you're going in and you, there's, your eye is absorbed into that. It wants to travel down all those little pathways and it wants to do just kind of follow the route that you went almost yeah. when you're making it. I think I think this is just a snippet of the piece uh, for our opening slide. But well, they just show some you know some landscapes here and. You yeah. entitled this "Entangled at the Stone House." So, is are some of these images there from around Medicine Hat? Is that? Yeah, actually, this picture here. Um, 
I do have a little bit of information here. I mean, I know some of it. This picture is actually on the military base, this house. It used to be a CPR house for, um, they, it, it's where families stayed and they looked after the water for the base. Um, so there's some history to this house. Um, it was built in 1883 um, and it, it, uh, produced the water for the steam engines that brought all the equipment to Suffield when Suffield was a military base in the 1940s and stuff like that. So the walls are like 16 inches thick and it's the scene that everybody sees that works out there um, when they travel to the, the, it's called the experimental proving ground. So it's an area where the science, <clears throat> they do science work out, like out in the field, testing and stuff. And so I've, I've it was, it's been a pick, you know, our photographers took lots of pictures of it over the years and it was a popular subject. So I decided I wanted to paint it. Your version and, of it. Yeah. Yeah. And it, so, it, so someone from the base it? bought it right away. So. so do you, do you work from photographs then or on, do you do some plein air too? No, I've never done, I think I've done plein air maybe twice way back, like years ago, but I work mostly from photographs I take. And sometimes it's partly a photograph and then I might make some of it up or, you know, yeah. take artistic license to take out yeah. trees or something to make something yeah. so look better this, and more balanced. This is a watercolor as well? Yeah, that was one of the first ones I did when I yeah. started. Yeah. And I was still, you know, trying to get my um, self back, getting used to a brush and paint because when I left my job and in 2015, I hadn't painted for probably 25 years, like in a traditional way. And it was all done on computer and, and with a stylus and really? mouse and things like that. So there is a big transition that I didn't, you know, I took for granted that I wouldn't be facing that. But when I started, I was like, oh, like I have to figure this out again. Yeah. And I didn't lose my creativity or my vision or my you know, sense of space and things like that, my sense of color and values and things like that. But I definitely had to, you know, work at getting that back because it's way different when you're painting straight in front of your, like straight in front of your eyes. When you're yeah. painting on a computer, your hand is over to the side. So, yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's a little bit of art. You like to do a little bit of, excuse me, a little bit of architecture, you know, there's, there's some, uh, I'm trying. I'm trying to get my lighting a little better, but it's not very good. Sorry, I'm working off site here a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. The lighting is terrible. There. Uh, yeah, my lighting's not good either. Yeah, I'm just, uh, <laughs> it's not going to make me look pretty. So anyway, no. As long as the lighting's good on your images that we're working yeah. on, and that's good. So this now is this a trestle bridge or is this uh, just a yeah? Leg? That bridge is in downtown Medicine Hat. Um, the where I'm standing is the city hall, so I'm looking across. Um, the bridge is what the first bridge that was ever built in Medicine Hat is called Finley Bridge. And the church that you see across the river is also a historic church. And I was just, I ride my bike a lot and hike a lot. So a lot of times I just take a picture, you know, of the lighting or something that piques my interest and I just paint it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I kind of go back and forth between landscapes and something else because I just, I get bored. I just can't paint the same thing all the time. So there's, there's nothing. I just liked the way the light was that day on the water. The water was, ice was just melting and there was a lot of sun and it just looked, you know, I could see a lot of color coming out that you do before spring arrives sort of thing. So, so do you work, does you work, try to represent like a historical aspects of things you do you like to record things like that uh, is that part of what you like to do i think i think it's more the connection with people i find in my art like i know that that church and that bridge does have a connection with people that live in medicine hat so right. um i think it's that thing and like you know, every time when I sell a painting, you know, I meet the person that's buying it most of the time in person. And and the person that bought this actually works at City Hall. And they were 
um, originally from England, but they've moved over here and they've, um, they actually worked at the military base and came over here with the military. And then they, you know, came to Medicine Hat and immigrated and they work at City Hall. And so this is a view he sees outside his, his office. And I've sold several prints of this, obviously, because, you know, it's very recognizable to many <clears throat> people in, in Medicine Hat. Yeah. This is an acrylic, so. Yeah. So I see your work is, you know, it has that, there's a nice, uh, I don't know what it says, a wispiness about it, yet it's got a hard edge line. And I can see that graphic area where you've had to, carry that mouse and you, you got to create a line work and fill it with uh you know when you do digital work but yeah your, your pieces have a there's kind of an ethereal feel about them i mean they this one's trying to catch i guess the light a little bit at night or something like that there's a kind of a yeah an aura i guess i'm looking yeah. at maybe that's the word is there's a bit of an aura in some of your work as we go farther into the pieces here, as we, as we talk about it. I've had other people say that to me too. It's kind of interesting that you say that because people have said that you, you seem like you're a spiritual, you kind of have a urethral feel about your art with lots of curves and movement and stuff. Um, this is one that I was trying to not paint realistic. Um, it's a watercolor and and I just, I don't know, I just started painting and I, it's one of those ones that I got lost in the detail. Like I feel, find it very calming and, yeah. you know, if you've got other things on your mind or, you know, all the bad news in the world, it just, it just zones me out into a different place. So Yeah, there's, yeah, there's very kind of stained glass feeling about it in the bottom yeah. especially, and through yeah. the, the background and the blues, you can see it could yeah. be, could be carried off as, a, as almost like a stained glass piece if. If, yeah. you, if somebody wanted to do one from that. Yeah, it's... it could. Yeah, it would be a little difficult at the top. But at the top, you know, it would be really, really yeah. good at it. You could do it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. it would it, well, be create new techniques, I would think. But it. it yeah. uh, uh, and this is a, these kind of trees occur down by our river bat, valley. So this is a walk I do quite a bit. And the walk is kind of down by the river and you look up a hill and these trees are kind of hanging over you. And they are really crooked like that. And just, they almost look like they were dancing, like, like yeah. in synchron synchronized together. So I just yeah. snapped a picture and decided I wanted to not just paint the tree, but just bring some, you know, other things into it, like yeah. color and movement and things like that. Well, it's got, a, it's got a feeling as well. So that's more than just the tree. The, the, yeah. the tree has a bit of life to it. And I, that's what's yeah. kind of neat about seeing, because it's really hard sometimes to put, that into an object that you've looked at and it, it really does come from your heart you you really yeah. have to feel what's going on yeah. yeah yeah um this one is uh i was riding my bike again and i was just overlooking we have a lot of coolies in medicine had a lot of cliffs and trees this is a, quite a popular park it's called kin coolie park a lot of families go there and on the top across I've painted this uh, Samus TP before, but not from this view. And I just thought it was kind of a, a different view than other than I've seen other artists paint. That TP was originally um, in the 1980 Olympics in Calgary. Um, and then it was brought to Medicine Hat. So it's kind of our, you know, landmark. Um, when you drive by on the highway, on the number one highway, you can't, you know, miss it. Yeah. So... And below so that's, there, so that's, a, that's a permanent structure. Yeah, yeah below, okay. below there, uh, kind of around the bend, not, not necessarily in this part, but on the, the coulee continues around the back of the teepee, there is um, an indigenous archaeology site. And it's quite, um, it's quite an important site. It's one of the largest claimed large sites in the Northern Plains with millions of, they figured there's millions of artifacts there. It was a buffalo, a place where they process buffalo meat. So I don't know what they mean by that. I don't think it was a buffalo jump, but it was a pr place where they process buffalo meat. Okay, yeah, so, they make, yeah, make pemmican and such from it. Yeah, so that, that used to be, a, uh, they ha at first had it in a loud, it to be a dog park but since they've kind of discovered how how precious that area is so now it's kind of you can still walk through it but 
it, you know, it's kind of blocked off and that. So that's why the TP was put there because it's overlooking that historical site. Oh, nice. Yeah. See, it's nice. It's nice to be able to understand that. And if you've got the opportunity to actually draw it or paint it, it becomes more personal. I think you start, yeah. I think you find that you, when you do with these and things like that, that you're learning more about it when you just have time to think and paint and. Yeah. Yeah. I, I tend to like if there's a structure or there's, you know, something, if I'm trying to um, convey a message or whatever, I, I try to find out and read about that subject matter as much as I can. I mean, I'm not, you know, I don't know at all. There's a lot of people that would know way more than I do, but I, I find that when I'm painting, then the painting um, will exude more meaning and more messaging. Um, there's really not a message in this, but it's basically just a visual landmark that is in Medicine Hat. And mm. but you know, I wanted to find out more about you know why that area was deemed to be you know sacred, kind of a sacred place, and had historical Indigenous artifacts and stuff. So I looked it up and I read a lot about that to kind so of just inform myself. Yeah. So does that excite you, like that learning part about Indigenous life and in your work? Is that like, I know we're going through some more stuff here that is more yeah. ind Indigenous I, I, related. I guess I've gotten older. I mean, I don't know what happened when I was younger, but I wished I, I have, have a, a capacity now that I just want to learn everything. You know, when I find out about, you know, oh, this is happening or, I, you know, this is a problem or this is a thing. I'm curious. I want to find out how it got to be like that, or why. why You're talking about the social, the social aspects of yeah, some of the social and, paintings, and the interaction. Some those, yeah. yeah, some of those paintings, yeah. and you know, and then with history, I if I see a historical building, I you know do the same thing. Yeah. This one is just. I was on my bike again. I was down by the river and in Strathcona Park. It's a park down in Medicine Hat and the sun was coming through, you know, it was one of those going to be a real hot summer day and, yeah. and the sun and the shadows were there. So this is another one that I tried to undo my, you know, um, exact type of style. Like the type, the type of style. Yeah. 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 So yeah. I tried to be more blocky painting it and more, I don't know what you call it. Like just not, not realistic. It's not impressionist, but it's, I don't know what it is. It might, so it, might, I yeah. it might be impressions in colors, but not so much in style. I don't know. You, you, I don't, I see your work is probably a bit more, it's a little hard edged. It's not really soft edged and blurred yeah. edges and things. So your work is quite defined and it's got strong, a, a strong feeling that if you can actually put a hard edge line on it and carry it together, it, it, it can, it can work very, very nicely. I mean, this one still has, is a lovely piece of work um you know the trail and it does give you that feeling of the day that uh, you talked about so but yeah i think too with with um you know i i can't i see i seem to paint very high contrast so i don't mm -hmm. set up to do that but <laughs> i just it's just in my head and all of a sudden you know the paint's down and i'm like oh i did it again <laughs> you know so this whole like right now there seems to be a lot of uh, movement towards impressionism and and sort of soft edges and whatever and i see that in a lot of artists are, i see a lot of artists trying to move and change their style because maybe it sells better right now because and i think art goes through phases like you know this is in style that's in style and I see a lot of artists trying to do that right now. And if, if they can do it and that is where they find their niche and whatever, that's great. But for me, I don't, I don't need to find myself fitting into a box, you know, where everyone else is going. I like to um, experiment and try, but if it isn't meant to be, it's just not meant to be. Like I, mm. I find I fight with myself when I'm trying to do that. So maybe that's just not me. So. Yeah, premeditation pre is a really tough thing to follow. If you've got a really defined idea and you try to stay to it, 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 it sometimes turns into a, either a really long project or it becomes, you become tired of it quickly because you're not getting what you want. Sometimes you just go with your feeling and, uh, 
yeah. you, go, you go down that pathway and it may not, it may be a different, but it also may be a, a great learning thing for the next stage of where you're going. So yeah, I don't think one painting does kind of lead to other ones, whether you know it or think about it at the moment. Yeah. But it, uh, so you're looking at the similarities between this piece and this piece. Yeah. So the color, the color pal palette, this has got, this is very spiritual. It's got a lot of energy to this piece. Uh, and I love it. I mean, you've done a number of uh, portraits that we'll go through here and I'll call them portraits. They're not specifically of a person, but I guess it is in that you work from a photo, but you know, the interpretation of the background and, and the energy that is there. And I think you're talking about loosening up. And I think this is closer to one of your loosening up pieces. I mean, just look at the backgrounds. And some yeah. of those things, right? So, maybe. Uh, you're, you're on, yeah, you're on your way. I mean, you're, you know, these are beautiful, beautiful pieces. Uh, so, did you take pictures of this uh, gentleman? Yeah, this was in Saskatoon at Wanaskewin. Wanaskewin, yeah, Wanaskewin. Wana Wana so yeah. we just happened to be there that weekend when we wanted to go. You know, I've always wanted to find out, you know, the history and what was there. So. We just happened to be there on a day when they had a demonstration and then the, there was a little round room at the back and this person, he's, he is from, I think, Pine Creek or Pine Creek. Is there a Pine Creek reservation? Mm -hmm. um, I did speak to him and briefly, like just talk to him about, you know, his dancing and whatever. And he actually was great with the crowd because he got all the kids up trying to teach them this hoop <laughs> dancing. And of course, you know, people can do, you know, one or two hoops, but this guy here, I think he ha uses up to 30 hoops and he just doesn't get tangled, which is, you know, really amazing. He was just a really nice person to listen to his journey with his indigenous history and, um, I find with myself, um, I spoke to you a little bit about this before, I, I have started to go to places where there is Indigenous demonstrations or powwows, dancing, um, because I just want to try to connect and find out more about their culture. Um, obviously, Canada's history, a lot of us did not know about the truth of what actually happened. And I've actually, you know, challenged myself to learn about that. And maybe part of that is because of where I was growing up. Um, North Balford has a lot of uh, reservations around it. And, you know, some of the indigenous kids were in our schools and growing up in North Balford, I did see a lot of addiction, a lot of, um, you know, social economic problems with the indigenous. And this is part of, I guess, where people say I have more of a spiritual um, type of look to my work because I want to bring a visual image so that people can see some beauty in their culture. Um, because I think too much, many times and, and, you know, over the years, people have assumed a lot and you know, they didn't know the whole story. It's, either, it's really easy to make assumptions, but um, a lot of times there's always a catalyst that brings something into being. So the whole Indigenous issue in our society, I think is just on the tip of the learning curve. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, you know, it will get better for them and for us to understand. But so this is why I, you know, like, you know, I'm obviously not Indigenous, and I don't try to do the art as an Indigenous artist, meaning in an Indigenous style. I mean, there's a lot of Indigenous art that looks different than mine, like it doesn't have the same look or style. I just do it in my own to represent, you know, what I saw and what yeah. I'm trying to convey. Yeah. This picture here is actually looks better in person. I couldn't really get a good picture of it <laughs> because there's foil in it. So I laid, laid, it's watercolor, but I laid it in foil and I found when I was taking the picture, the foil was, you know, creating all kinds of light things on the yeah, camera. It does. Yeah. So. No, it's a beautiful piece. And I think it, it represents beautiful love energy that's, that's there. I mean, uh, I mean, these kind of pictures, I, I do have them up on the site, but if I could find this guy, I would just give him the picture because <laughs> for me, it's not, I, I don't, I'm not my first line of action isn't selling the art all the time um i find that i get some value out of doing the art so you know if i get so much for a painting or i get you know all that 
connection when I'm doing it, both of them are equal to me. So yeah, you should you should just reach out to the Wanuskewin Museum, and I'm sure they could uh, connect well, you with. The well, I know the person's name. I did find him, and I, but I don't have an email. I don't have any way to get a hold of him, and I did send an email to Wanuskewin. Okay. So. Yeah. I don't know if anything will become of it. Well, follow it up again. Sometimes those things get yeah. lost and it's worth doing for sure. Yeah. So this piece here, was this from your mind or was this is this? Yeah, partly. Person? Well, I had the picture of the path. So this is a path that I take when I was hiking at Cypress Hills on Alberta side. Um, I had a picture of this path, but I wanted to do some, usually around this time of year, I do a picture for Truth and Reconciliation. So this was last year's picture. The hooped one was this year's picture. Um, so I emphasize on missing and murdered Indigenous women. So that's why there's a girl with a red dress. So if you look close in the bottom right, there's the red handprint. It's kind of graph, kind of yeah. graphically put in amongst the okay. foliage. Yeah. Um, so that's what this is. And... and the kind of transparent lines and urethral type of thing going up into the sky is basically representing their spirit and their ties to the land. And so that's what I was trying to portray in this. And again, it's just to bring a visual um, introduction to, for, to get people to think about this. So again, when I, you know, I didn't really know a lot about missing and murdered indigenous women. So I looked up some information and, you know, they're, they're, the information compared to, you know, non-Indigenous people, there are so many more girls missing. And, you know, really, if it was the other way around, they'd be, I think, society would pay more attention to it. Yeah. So I just want people to, you know, consider those facts and really think about them and maybe just open their minds a little bit to not assume so much all the time. Yeah, I, I think it's really important that an artist, um, if they can, take a stand on some of these social issues and make that either part of their work or actually occasionally make commentary that uh, become visually impactful so people can start seeing it from different directions and from different points of view. And I think, uh, I think it's really important uh, and, and it's one of your skill sets that you can share with people is is your ability to Maybe, like you said, you when you're doing your drawings, like you're standing above and you, you're trying to draw something that doesn't exist that you in front of you to, to purvey, and you have to make something out of nothing almost to yeah. say your story, right? Yeah. So I think that's that. This is a beautiful piece. I mean, you you really do give a feeling that she's there, but she's not there. It's wispy. It's almost this dreamlike feeling that she's walking through the beautiful land. And you don't know whether her feet are touching the ground or not. Like it's just because it's a flowing, it's the flowing red dress, the way it's part yep. of the, it's part of the landscape, but yeah. it's part of her as well. So it's a beautiful piece. Yeah. You know, it has a really nice, and there's a, there is a positive about it. She's heading towards a nice light. Like it's not a, yeah. not a dark painting. And yeah. it's, it has a really nice energy. Uh, Shelly, I really like this one. It's very nice. Yeah, well, red red has significance in the indigenous. It circles. does. Yeah. Now this one's a little bit, little as a somber area as well, right? It, so you know, this we, one here, um, what happened was it's kind of a synchronicity story. So um, our family was had um, has been touched by this problem. I have a brother that was you know addicted for years and worked and didn't work and ended up on the street for quite some time in some real perilous conditions. Uh, the happy thing to report is he did get him, some, he got COVID, got really sick and almost died. And I think that and the family supporting him, he had family support from everyone in our family, which was great. And I'm happy to report that he has been sober for, you know, 18, almost two years. And he's off the street and he has his own apartment. But in in being exposed to that when we when I was helping him, I was in Edmonton and I saw the areas where these homeless people live and just, you know, I guess I was, you know, I see it on the news, but when you're not 
near it and you don't see it every day, it it isn't something you really understand the severity of what is going on. Yeah. And so now when I see people like in this situation, which this guy's name is Corey, he lives in Medicine Hat and he was around Tim Hortons and and I gave him, you know, bought him some food one day and didn't really talk to him that much. But then one day I thought, you know, I should get out and talk to him and, I, you know, just, you know, treat him like a person. So I did. I uh, went over and talked to him and he was standing in front of, right, right where he was behind was the Medicine Hat Mall. And, you know, I was listening to his story and was asking him why he doesn't go to the homeless shelter and talking a little bit about his addiction and in and out of addiction he is. And and, you know, behind me, I looked at all the cars and all the people coming out of the mall with their packages and all the signs, buy this, buy that. And then lo and behold, about, uh, so I thought, you know, I want to do a social painting again about this problem. I want people to think about who that person is, what their story is, how they got there. You know, what hardships brought them mentally to a place where that's where they found themselves. And so that was my whole point of the painting. But then uh, the Alberta Society of Art put a call out for open call for um, paintings on consumerism. And, and so, you know, and how consumerism is affecting social systems in our, in our society and how it's affecting the environment as well. Because the more manufacturing, the more things we buy, the more throwaway things we have and, and it's affecting the environment. It's making prices go up. It's making, you know, sources of, you know, food sources of <clears throat> housing go up. So there's a bigger picture effect to, you know, if you need to have, you know, a hundred pairs of shoes, there's an effect <laughs> to that, you know, and I'll be the first to admit like years ago, you know, I was one of those people that didn't think about that. And, um, but, I have changed now over the years and I don't, I don't care about buying stuff anymore. And I do think about that. So I entered this in that show and it was accepted. It's going to drum hell. It's starting, I think October 3rd. So this painting will be in drum heller in the gallery there. What gallery is that? You know what? I can't think of the name of the gallery, but it's Alberta society of art that's okay. sponsoring it. Okay. So I dropped yeah. the painting off in Calgary last week and okay. there's, this painting will be going to the Drumheller Gallery because that's like where the consumerism. <clears throat> so it'll be interesting to see what other people, how other people convey that. Yeah. Because, you know, it, it's another thing, you know, how do you convey consumerism? How do you, you're going to paint something that isn't really there, yeah. you know, if you want to get a message across. So I think, I think Andy Warhol was doing that in the mm -hmm. 60s. Yeah. Um, as well about consumerism uh, in more graphic way that he did in graphic design. Basically, as a graphic designer, he was doing them very much. Yeah. Uh, the stacks of Brillo and some of the other Campbell soups and the manufacturing, all the stuff yeah. that he was well known for. Yeah. Um, so, but and his wasn't so much in a in a. It was the early stages of it, of of bringing things in. Uh, what you're talking about is almost the response to that the overwhelming amount of stuff that's available that other people just don't have access to well the reason i put the whole cory in and the, you know that was the way his sign looked that's exactly what his sign said i want to bring the human element into it because you know you can paint a lot of you know plastic bottles i thought about painting bottles or painting cans you know throw away garbage or maybe doing a collage of garbage in with the painting but then I thought, you know, you wanted to paint, you wanted to bring this homeless thing into art and get people to think about it so I could find a way that this would fit. So that's yeah. why I did this. Well, and nice. since then, I've actually stopped and talked to him quite a few times. Yeah. He knows my name and I know his name. <laughs> and, and well, that's we important. have like a rapper board going now. Yeah. So <clears throat> This is gorgeous. I love that. I love the hair, just the hair is just has this beautiful flow in the water. And uh, can you talk about this piece a little bit? Uh, yeah, this bit? is another kind of social, um, you know, spiritual thing. I, I was painting a different picture and, you know, sometimes I'll put music on. Sometimes I have the TV on and the news is on. And 
I was listening to and watching video, you know, footage of the wars that are going on in our world right now, um, you know, specifically Israel and Gaza, the Ukraine and Russia. And, you know, I was looking at the people that are caught, you know, so innocently, like they have nothing to do with the government. They have nothing to do with, you know, being part of a terrorist group or anything like that. Or, And I was just moved you know, to, to try to bring an image about boundaries, how war just creates, you know, it stops you in your tracks if you're, if you happen to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. So what this image is, is um, fire and water are natural boundaries. So I put fire and water and I was trying to convey, you know, how people are fragmented and blown apart and you know your mom and dad might be that way and your three kids are lost and they're over here because you're all running from you know trying to save your lives yeah. um families are you know yeah, they, they, in yeah. different directions and they might not see each other for years they might even not know if each other is alive right. and so that's all i just want people to think about it you know peace really is it really in our hands because people say that comment all the time and, you know, it's kind of a human response to war, but, you know, you can say it as many times as you want, but if it, if the people in power aren't listening, I mean, yeah. really, how do we control this? Like, I mean. No, these are, these are, yeah, these are tough subjects and um, they're tough paintings to do, especially as a, it's got to be kind of a, a painting a lot of times is universal. It can be, and it doesn't have to have words. People understand it in every language and who, who look yeah. at things. And this one has a. And I wasn't trying to convey any side here. Or, yeah. You know, because it affects everybody. It affects yeah. on all sides. Yeah. It's just the human side of the human side of war. And, yeah. and it doesn't matter what country you're in or what street you're on. If you're on either side and a bomb falls, you're going to go through the same thing. That's right. And all of that other stuff is going to be gone and you're just going to be trying to survive. So, um, this picture was just a commission. Um, it was a British soldier that had been, you know, in Afghanistan and, and Iraq, I think, as well. And his wife got it for him to, to kind of display all his medals and make a memory of that. Mm. So, at the base where I worked, there's um, Canadian forces are there. So, it's quite a unique base. There's Canadian... Uh, uh, Canadian forces there are kind of the landlords, and then there was us, the research station. But there was also three to 4,000 British military that used to come and train there every year because we had 1,000 square kilometers to have, like, live wars, live ammunition and tanks and stuff like that. Yeah. So this person now is living in Medicine Hat, has immigrated, and his wife just got this painted for him. Very nice, yeah. No. As a very uh, least we forget is a perfect one because remembrance is coming up in November 11th again. Yeah. Yeah. So it's good. Yeah. This is that the full painting from the one we started in the the, the yeah. initial when we opened up on the picture. So I just yeah. love I love florals and I love the way people. Some are very delicate. Some are yeah. aggressive, and this I don't know where this one is. It's delicate, but it it's also it is also a very it's an aggressive painting as well yeah. i think it's just the line movement in the flow and the energy of of, of the petals and uh the, the inner eye of the of the flower you know just there's something about it and but you know what your stuff is all tied together nicely like whether you're doing florals or it seems uh, figurative work i think your career has probably uh it's definitely influenced where you're going <laughs> whether you yeah. can see it or not and i think you can and it's nice to loosen up, but you know, I think embrace these uh, the energies that you can create from your line work. And uh, I mean, you will transition back and forth, but I think you found a a lovely energy to be your voice, I guess, into your work. Um, and I think that's that's all you can really say as an artist if you can have um, your, your work being looked at and understood. I think it's yeah. really an important thing. Yeah. And here's and here's your most abstract piece that you've got in our in our viewing here. You're, yeah. He talks and, us quickly quickly about this piece because we got to go here pretty quick. Yeah. Uh, this one here was actually 
I, I did set out to do an abstract. Um, this is the hardest piece out of all of them. I fought with this piece. I just, I think I told you, I just about ripped it up. Um, it's acrylic on paper. So but what I found, cause I just was trying to do, you know, how would acrylic act on watercolor paper? So I put gesso down on the paper and just not a lot cause I wanted some of it to soak in. So you can see in the upper right, there's some areas that are kind of, they're not real thick acrylic, yeah. but what I ended up doing is, you know, fighting with it and I didn't like it. So then I got <laughs> some white paint and negative painted it. And all of a sudden this flower sort of thing came out of it. And the good accident was, you know, if you look in kind of the center right, there's petals there where the paper kind of, um, I guess it was so saturated, it kind of shriveled up like a, and it has texture like a, like a flower paddle. So I thought, wish, oh, yeah. well, this is, yeah. <laughs> this is a good accident. So I yeah. ended up keeping this one and, and, but you know, this just shows how much I struggle with trying to not paint so much detail. I yeah. just loose thing, really loose thing up. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not so much abstract, but what it is, is just looking at um, volume shapes and forms yeah and not trying to fill in those volume shapes and forms with high amounts of linear de detailing and stuff yeah. but i think you've got a great graphic eye i think it looks lovely i, I think we've had a great conversation it's beautiful work for sure <clears throat> well there well, he thank is thank you for the opportunity i appreciate having that exposure. Like it, it doesn't and I, and I mean this is a compliment your stuff doesn't look real it's that it's that like when you look at it it's like it doesn't look real it's that well, I don't it's just that be beautiful realistic. Yeah, I don't yeah. want to be a realistic. No, baby, I just wanna... in general, it looks like it just magically appeared, and I like that. That's very, it's very beautiful. I and Paul knows I collect, so it, that's like a compliment for me. So uh, take it for what it's worth. <laughs> well, thank but you. I do, I like it. It's absolutely gorgeous stuff. Um, and some of it, I was just like, wow, like you painted that. Like literally, it looks like it just appeared, and out of like you know, out of like a Harry Potter movie um, type well, of I thing. So I really a lot liked of time it. Time on my painting. I, you know, I think I had a career for. 35 years where I had to rush, get this done, you know, right. I had deadlines to meet. And now I'm really like, I think I talked to Paul. One of the things I'm lacking is I'm not very promotional about myself. Right. Um, people say, well, why don't you do that? And I said, because every time I do that, I'm not, I don't have time to paint then. Okay. Because, you know, when you're an artist, you, you have to split your time between promoting and running to the galleries and contacting, or do you want to sit for four hours and paint? And, you know, I picked right. the latter mm -hmm. because I just, I don't want it to get like a job. Just, I just, just, just throw your stuff on Instagram and yeah. in time people will find you and you trust me, your stuff is just, people will look at it and go, wow. And that, and you will have fans overnight. I mean, this will help this interview. All, all three yeah. of our fans will watch it, yeah, but this, this you'll have fans on Instagram. Me, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I've sold That's... a couple of paintings from through this artist in Canada site and I've got, you know, some connections. And, that, and that's a question now. So if someone wants to buy an original from you, not a print, what do your originals go for from what to what? Well, I'm not that I, that I don't have down pat either. So I know there's, you know, uh, so much per square inch. Right. Um, um, but, you know, I, I sell my paintings, you know, like probably a 30 by 40 one. I charge $1,500 for it. Okay. And it's not, you know, it's, I'm not making, you know, I'm probably making $5 an hour by the time I add my <laughs> right. time. But that's my preference to yeah. spend that time on it. Someone right. that's more an impressionist painter might be able to whip that off and, you know, because the style allows them to be a little bit freer and right. they may be done that in two days. Right. But for me, again, you know, and I do get in trouble with other artists and I do see their point because they're, you know, on me about you should be charging, blah, blah, blah. Right. But it's also for me, you know, I don't want, like, I, I've painted about 100 paintings in the last four years and I have about 10 left in the house. I've sold all of the rest of them. Nice. Very and nice. And I've just sold them through local contacts. I have them in a couple of coffee shops, like artist type galleries. Sure. and social media and part of the reason they sell is because they obviously like the work which i appreciate right. but it also gives them an opportunity to have original art right. and i i don't want 100 paintings in my basement like i don't have room for them <laughs> right. and and i i'm not connected to the painting 
right. when I'm done, people say, well, don't you want to keep that? And I'm like, well, no, I'll, I'll, I will I get the connection in the actual doing of the art. When I'm right. in that zone, that is worth hundreds of dollars to me. And right. that's where my connection is in the art. And once it's done, I'm on to the next thing and gone. So but she's the perfect artist. Yeah. So, yeah, right. Because you know, like you're not attached to it. Artists. I would be a typical starving artist. Because, <laughs> you know, and I think with anything, like it doesn't matter what career, you can take a lawyer, you can take anything. You all have to start at a point and you're not going to get paid all the big bucks right away. And this part of my art career, I mean, is in its infancy. I've only started painting in 2020. So right. for me to sell that many paintings in the last few years, I appreciate that. And I'm very thankful that you know, people did take interest in my art and supported me. I just didn't even think it would be a thing. I, I started with watercolor and I said to my husband, well, what am I going to do with all these, these, these paintings? I don't want to keep them. So I threw them up on social media and I had the first one I threw up. I had like about 15 replies wanting because it was a local scene. So people knew what it was. And then I, I thought, okay, well, I'm surprised. And and because I don't really feel, um, I probably lack a little bit of confidence in where I am in my art because I left it for so many years. You know, you, I'm starting to get better at that, right. but I didn't paint for so many years. So I was kind of bumbling around when I started four years ago, like I mentioned at the beginning of this interview. Um, but, you know, typically I, I sell between some smaller pieces. I sell for like three, four hundred dollars. You know, okay. like I sold a watercolor of a, a historical house and I posted it online and it sold in a half an hour because it's people it's... know that house around here. Right. And I sold it for, I think, $400, three, 390 or five. And, and, and our joke with everybody from Canada is if someone wants to buy your work outside of Canada, so basically it's free and you just charge a lot for shipping because yeah. of the conversion <laughs> to euros to dollars. Yeah. So 1500 yeah. euro is... It's in Canadian, it's like $6. So it's just a lot for shipping she charges. Yeah. So don't worry about that. Medicine yeah. Hot is not too far from the border. Well, shipping is just atrocious. Yeah. I sold a couple to Ontario and it costs like right. $220 to ship it. But they oh, you just roll them up. You just roll them up. You don't even ship them framed. Well, these were a cat. Oh, you take them right off the. <laughs> yeah, yep, you take them. So when I buy something, we have artists we buy from around the world. We have a guy overseas and when we buy from him, he will un frame it so to speak or un take it from the you know the, whatever and he'll roll it up two bit but he sends it to our framer with exact instructions and a email pictures of how it should be framed so when we finally go get it or it's delivered it looks exactly like it looked like in his studio oh so that's okay. a way to do it that shaves on your um your shipping because now you're not shipping if you will uh you know a 30 by 40 or whatever you're shipping a tube you insure it and it's off to the races yeah. Yeah. So when so. you do that, when you un, you know, pull off the staples and you, and you fold it up, you, you don't get any cracking or any. Our stuff, we've been very lucky, but I think he, some of the stuff, I think he knows that since he has international people, what he does is I don't think he staples when he does it. I think he uses the clamps oh. on the side. So he holds it with the clamps. So if someone says, I want that and they don't live in that country, he just, no problem. <laughs> Yeah, you roll, he's, done. Painting, he's just painting on flat canvas then. you roll, yeah you roll yeah. your paintings paint side out right don't, yeah. don't roll them paint side in paint <laughs> okay. side out so it doesn't constrict yeah. the paint the other way if it's yeah. thicker and then a lot of ones will if they have the frames or the stretchers that fit together they'll take them out and they put them in between yeah, the roll up tube so basically the whole thing is in a tube and it goes for yeah. you know, yeah. 40 50 dollars you can ship the yeah. whole thing uh, and then they take out the framer, takes it out, takes the stretchers, puts them together, and then restretches the painting. Yeah. So we can do yeah. that. Yeah, get a lot to us. But so, but, yeah. just so, there you go. So if yeah. anybody would like to get a hold of you and they can't figure it out, contact us at the show. We'll put you in touch with Paula Shelley, and you guys can buy whatever she has. You can follow her apparently on Facebook, or I'm assuming Instagram as well. Yeah, um, I have. And she's on Artists in Canada on our website. Yeah. And uh, right. Rogers is at the back on the back end of this interview as well. Yeah. So there you go. So you guys will have that. So. To her. Yeah. Sally, yeah. it was a pleasure meeting you. Thank you so much. Good luck with everything. And everyone yeah. will see you next week with yeah, an, another artist. Thank you very artist. much for the opportunity. I yeah. really appreciate it. Yeah. Hang Enjoy. in. Love your stuff.
Yeah, hang See in. See you later. Okay. Cheers, in. everybody. Not you. Yeah. Your cheers to the fans. You stay. So yeah. cheers. <laughs>